Welcome to the COVID-19 podcast, proudly brought to you by the Namibian. Hello and welcome to the COVID-19 podcast. This is, as usual, the podcast where we talk anything and everything COVID-19, as well as debunk myths related to the pandemic. Now, the question for today is, can our political parties save us? This is the headline for Christy Cornell's new COVID-19 column this week, and this obviously will be the center of our discussion today. Christy Cornell is, of course, a researcher at Survey Warehouse and joins us today via Zoom from South Africa. Hi, Christy. How is it? How are you? Good. Thank you. We hope that you're enjoying your time there in, in South Africa. It's cold, but very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's good. It, as long as you're enjoying <laughs> yourself. Now, to get right into it, you write in your article that one would expect political parties to be very active amid a crisis like the pandemic. What is it, in your expert opinion, Christy, that you think political parties should be doing during the pandemic? What, what, what do you think they, they can do, actually? Well, I think, you know, on, in the one, on the one hand, pandemics create uh, extensive uh, uh, crises, if you like. Uh, they create uh, and bring to the fore certain pertinent issues that needs to be addressed. It highlights social and other problems that societies may have economic problems. Um, And one would have thought that as the primary organizations in a democracy, political organizations in a democracy, uh, political parties would be bouncing on the opportunities to come up with possible solutions to some of these problems, Um, or that they would sort of be more active in protecting and performing a watchdog function over government, those sorts of things. But uh, our feeling is that things have gone really quiet and it's almost as if the enormity of the crisis had overrun the opposition parties. And even the ruling party has Mm. been really quiet uh, on on issues relating to COVID. Okay, now I want to focus specifically on um, opposition parties, right? Isn't it sort of difficult to... I guess, execute a plan or even just put a blueprint forth without having executive power? Because otherwise, then you're just a megaphone as political parties are known, uh, opposition political parties are known to be, isn't it? Well, the, the, the point is, if we, if we have to wait until we get executive powers, then mm. any of the political parties would ne- not necessarily make a contribution. Uh, The role of parties is to come up with political blueprints, to come up with plans, and to sell those plans to voters so that when the next election comes around, Mm -hmm. voters have uh, a very good idea and has knowledge and has made their preference for whichever of these blueprints they've got. I think if you you consider the extent of the problems that we're facing, you know, kickstarting the economy, dealing with what promises to be a, the highest level of unemployment we've ever had. And we can see, uh, you know, just in recent times that people are getting frustrated. Mm-hmm. Um, people are, are not receiving what they think they should be receiving, you know. So when those sorts of things present themselves, they do present clues to political parties yeah. as to what the issues are that needs to be addressed. And I would have thought this would be an ideal opportunity for opposition parties specifically to sit down and start preparing themselves for the period hereafter. I mean, mm. we're two years into this current term. Um, the problems are obvious for everyone to see. So if you're not going to get started now, when will you get started Exactly. Uh, and what what are our options? You know, um, I think we're we're sort of in a almost like a leaderless situation, a bit of a vacuum, no. where nobody really knows where to go. You know, one would have thought that, uh, for example, uh, something like like this service plan delivery or job creation, those sorts of things would have been important. Our president has appointed a task team on the fourth revolution, you know, this post-industrial kind of technology thing. Mm -hmm. The question is, is this where we're going? You know, uh, is this 
And how do you link that to the sort of uh, immediate problems of food insecurity, lack of adequate housing, uh, serious problems in education, serious problems in terms of economic survival? Um, and again, you know, there's no plan coming from anybody. So I think we're in a bit of a leaderless vacuum and, you know, things are a bit all mixed up. I would have thought political parties are ideally positioned to be able to provide us with leadership to save us from this this kind of dilemma that we're in. Yeah, and it's interesting you say um, sort of leader leaderless um, vacuum. And I think that that vacuum will sort of be extended now because um, in your article, you also write that now only 25% of those aged 18 to 25 years um, feel close to a political party. And as opposed to um, that same group, um, I think it was, what, 50% in 2017. So we can yes. see sort of a gradual decline of um, the sort of, interest from young people um, towards any other political affiliation or I guess politics in general. So will we now see a country where youth aren't um, interested in politics and will this be attributed to the pandemic itself or, you know, um, a combination of other issues as well? Look, I think if we look at these kinds of figures uh, and the question here really is, you know, if uh, we assume that political parties have these important functions to fulfill, mm -hmm. we assume that political parties have a particular standing within our democracy. Mm -hmm. But it appears that, you know, and again, this is, this is not the first time we've seen this, but there has been a decline in, the, in, in our institutions that predates uh, this pandemic. Mm -hmm. The pandemic is not the cause of whatever of these problems we suddenly start seeing. These problems have been around for a long time, and the pandemic has just exacerbated them, has drawn them uh, quicker and deeper into the public uh, yeah. sphere, if you like. You know, we, we haven't developed a housing crisis as a result of COVID. That mm -hmm. problem predates COVID. The same thing with education. Our institutions are so frail um, that in some cases, we're heading for an institutional collapse. And the question we, we, we would like to, or the, the, the issue we wish to highlight with these kinds of figures is that political parties are part of that sort of problem. Yeah, As definitely. political institutions, political parties are simply not held in high regard. It's uncommon uh, to have less than, you know, or let me say 25% of the youth feel themselves close to a political party. That is an institutional crisis. Mm -hmm. It to us says that political parties are struggling to be relevant. Um, and the functions that political parties play uh, in a society and in a democracy, that of mobilizing people primarily, offering them alternatives, giving them a sense of belonging politically, giving them a sense to participate politically. Those things seem to be disappearing quite quickly, and political parties have to ask themselves questions. And some of those questions are, what do they offer people, and in this case, specifically the youth? Um, and where we stand right now, it feels as if there's not much coming. It's interesting you mention um, the, the issue of mobilization, that parties are practically founded on you know, um, physical mobilization. I mean, that's how they draw their strength. That's how they they, they get uh, members and all of that. But it's sort of difficult to do that because that has obviously been a tradition within political parties. Um, it's sort of difficult to do that um, within the pandemic because physical mobilization isn't as um, advised as it was, you know, five years ago, even three years ago. So it's now, I, I think it's quite difficult for especially position parties to, sort of get closer to the electorate during this pandemic because now they have to be innovative and find different means of um, sort of drawing the attention of the electorate. But it's difficult to do that now because physical mobilization doesn't work anymore. It's a dangerous thing now, you understand. So is it a thing of them not being innovative or what do you think is happening? Yeah, I, I just feel, you know, this is only one part of mobilizing people. Where are the ideas? Mm. Who's telling us how we're going to create jobs? Yeah. Uh, who's going to lead us? 
into some form of, of economic recovery? What are the plans? What should we do? Um, where would we find money to fund some of the things that needs funding? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think we shouldn't underestimate the amount of frustration that's already there because, um, again, you know, the issue about people not having adequate housing in urban areas is an issue that's been around for a long time. It's not as if political parties are discovering it today. No. In fact, none of them has come up with a plan on how to do this. I mean, by the time Namibia got its independence, around 28% of the population lived in urban areas. That's mm -hmm. now 58%. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, this uh, issue of mobilization, you have to have ideas to mobilize people. You have to present people with alternatives and seeing where we are, seeing that the economy has been struggling the last six, seven years, seeing that our social problem uh, remain, you know, they're not getting better. This pandemic has just added to the pressure and political parties are not responding. I don't hear about think tanks being contracted to sit down and come up with ideas. I don't see political leadership debating things. I don't see new proposals for, say, things like income grants or, you know, what are the plans for job creation? Yeah. What are we going to do when this pandemic is over? And I think that's, that's been the frustrating part for people. And, and it's seen in the way people have voted in the last elections and also now with data like this that shows that most people and especially younger people have big problems feeling themselves close to any political parties because political parties in that sense maybe do not present anything to people so that they could sort of, uh, you know, muster their support or put their support into that. So I think, you know, to blame COVID is, is naive I think it's also very convenient, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. The decline in political party uh, feelings towards political parties is not due to COVID. COVID is just making it worse. So um, I think this is a trend that we've been on a slippery slope and we've been going down. And if you look at the data, that's been the case since 2014. You know, in 2014, 85% of rural people said they felt close to a political party. Mm. That is now 34%. Shocking. In 2014, 74% of urban people felt close to a political party. That is now 26%. Mm. So it's a huge problem, and it's a problem that's been around for a while, and our political parties are not coming to terms with this fact. Maybe they're not confronting this. No. Do you think, um, but, Christy, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, man. Do you think no? that it's um, on the owners of the leading uh, or the ruling party, rather, because they, I mean, government is basically, uh, for lack of better words, the guise of um, the, the ruling party, right? Um, and obviously with the ruling party having executive power and still not either bringing... Um, you know, sort of plans forth under the party umbrella and just under the government umbrella. Do you think that it's on them as a ruling party to sort of um, lead by example and come out and start talking about blueprints that they have um, to navigate throughout the pandemic, um, blueprints that they have to, you know, deal with the situation post the pandemic? Do Because, I mean, I haven't seen anything from the ruling party. I've seen government do something, but in as much as government is a ruling party, uh, government leads under the umbrella of the Namibian government and not under the ruling party. So do you think that the ruling Look, party think, should sort of, you know, take that first step as well? Well, it, all political parties. That's why my question, mm. um, you know, on whether political parties, can political parties save us? I'm mm -hmm. not saying opposition or a, a, a ruling party. The problem is um, government or or ruling parties mm -hmm. are, are government is government right yeah, yeah. it's the government of the day with yes. the emphasis of the day because it can change and we've seen for example certain of the subnational levels of government where the ruling party is no longer swapu party mm. but what previously would have been known as opposition parties so the ruling parties in the south or in Bantuk and so on 
They're not Swapo Party. No. They're the ruling party, ruling uh, you know, government of the day in those locations. So to say it's just a sort of a, a, a Swapo Party thing would be wrong. I th- I, I'm including all parties in this. No. We don't see... Um, yeah, if, if ruling parties uh, are the government of the day, then opposition parties are governments in waiting. So everybody wants to be elected. Everybody wants to become the government. The yeah. question is, what program are you offering? What solutions are you offering yeah. to those who have to vote, right? And my issue around the pandemic is that it has highlighted so many of the burning issues. It is, it is very difficult to understand how political parties are not using this opportunity that's been afforded to them to develop new programs, to develop alternatives, to think outside the box, because it is going to be required. If we go on the way we do, and we allow this frustration, remember, political parties are also an instrument through which people can voice their frustration. Mm -hmm. If there's no support for political parties, how will people voice their frustration? Definitely. That takes us to this point of defiance, um, illegalities in terms of, 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 of how people go about wanting to achieve what they think they should, they should be able to achieve in a democracy like ours. So there are consequences to this. We cannot indefinitely postpone the fact that people are unhappy, that there are problems in society, and that political parties are primary institutions for helping us address those problems. And hence the the argument that we're putting forward, there's not much happening. And we can see it in the data that just how much people are distancing themselves from political parties. And that problem is going to get worse because the younger people now are the furthest away from political parties, but they will become the next political generation and the one thereafter and the one thereafter. Exactly. You know, that's where the challenge Christy, is. Unfortunately, Christy, we'll have to leave it there. We're running out of time. But as usual, you always bring, bring burning issues to this uh, podcast and to this conversation. And for that, we're always thankful. Um, I think uh, your, your, your headline says it all. Can our political parties save us um that's the question that we all have to ask ourselves in the meanwhile i would always urge us to keep safe um keep sanitizing keep wearing your mask keep social distancing get vaccinated of course if you can um and think about these burning issues you know um uh, covid 19 is not only health it's not only economy it's, it's politics as well it's it's our everyday life so once again thanks a lot christy hoping you enjoy your time in south africa Uh, My name is John Colin Amene and until next time, this was the COVID-19 podcast. Cheers. Cheers.